Welcome to our lecture online. In the previous videos, we've been using inductive reasoning to come up with a reasonable solution. How did we do that? Well, inductive reasoning includes finding a pattern and performing observations, looking for examples or trends, be able to draw a logical conclusion. So we're looking at a pattern and we're trying to figure out what the next item in the pattern will be or the next number in the series will be. But there's some weaknesses when we use inductive reasoning. And I see it actually a lot in my classrooms. When students come up with a solution that is not correct based upon an initial premise and then drawing conclusions from that and then leading that to their answer. And so let's take a look at what some of the weaknesses are when we do inductive reasoning. First of all, a small sample doesn't always indicate how a large population can be represented. Even though you look at a small sample and say, okay, this looks like the pattern, and therefore this pattern must continue in the total population, which may not always be the case if your sample is small and you haven't allowed a large enough uh, sample pattern to dictate what you think is going to happen in the total population. The second one here is probably the, the biggest one of them all starting with an incorrect original assumption and then building the case up from that. If the original assumption is not correct, everything else that comes after that, even though it may be correct, cannot possibly lead you to the correct solution if we started with the incorrect original assumption. So I would say that's probably the most prevalent and the most important weakness of inductive reasoning. We must make sure that every statement, every start of the reasoning pattern is correct, especially where you begin, where you start. Sometimes a bias will creep in. You may have an initial bias in looking at a particular pattern. And because of that bias, maybe because you're experiencing experiences, you may think of the pattern representing something that it does not. So we have to be careful not to allow a personal bias or an experience bias to set us off track on the original premise. The fourth one is a presumption without basis or validity. Just simply making a statement and assuming that it's correct or true, even though we have nothing to base it on or there's no way to validate that particular statement. It's just a statement that's kind of hanging loose by itself and it doesn't really, doesn't really represent anything that we can hang it on to for sure. And finally, when you make an opinion instead of a unbiased observation. We're looking at an example, we're looking at an experiment, we see what's happening, and you draw an opinion rather than strictly taking it for its observation. A good example of that would be if the rooster crows in the morning, every morning, and after that the sun rises, you may draw the conclusion that it's the crow that causes the sun to rise, because that's your opinion based upon your observation. So it's not necessarily that it's wrong, but the logical conclusion after that cannot be correct because everybody knows even if the rooster doesn't crow, the sun will continue to rise in the morning anyway. So that's a little example of why we need to be careful not to rest on an opinion, rather a strict observation and then try to make some logical conclusion from that. So again, we have now seen some ways of dealing with inductive reasoning by finding patterns, by performing observations, looking for examples and trends, and we do have to be careful that we don't throw in something that might get us off track. And once we're off track, we can get to the proper solution. We'll see some additional examples of that in the future, but now we're going to take a look at deductive reasoning, which is a different way of trying to come up to the correct solution. And that's how it's done.